Hello Time Lords and Time Ladies, I'm this guy and this is my world of stuff. I uh, hope you're all keeping well, it's a wild and crazy blowy night out there tonight so apologies for any um, extraneous wind sound effects you might hear, they're not coming from me. It's a wild all night. Um, I'm doing an unusual uh, video tonight, I'm doing um, what I hope is an exclusive review of a just released DVD which will be of interest to fans of TV's top time lord Doctor Who. It's this new DVD called JNT Uncut. John Nathan Turner, in his own words, um, an exclusive interview with Bill Baggs. Now, a little bit of context, a little bit of historical context. When Doctor Who went off the air in 1989, some enterprising fans uh, managed to keep the flame alight, either by writing a new series of books for Virgin uh, Publications, who took on the license to do new publishing, uh, publish new Doctor Who books when the show went off air, and... Uh, some very enterprising uh, Doctor Who fans who went on to create their own uh, straight-to-video adventures. Now, some of them were based on licensable characters and monsters from Doctor Who, and some were characters which were Doctor Who by any other name. Uh, one of these companies was BBV Productions, which was uh, headed up by Bill Baggs, who produced a number of titles which often featured cast from Doctor Who, like Colin Baker, Sylvester McCoy, John Pertwee, Peter Davis, and a lot of the ex-Doctor Who stars got involved in these low-budget but very creative and imaginative science fiction uh, short films. Uh, titles like The Zero Imperative, Summoned by Shadows and the Strangers, and Bill created the organisation called Probe, which is a sort of, I suppose you call it a unit torchwood sort of hybrid that investigated strange supernatural shenanigans, which also, again, involved licensed Doctor Who characters and um, creatures from the series. So Doctor Who's kept alive by people like Bill and people like Big Finish and people like um, the people who wrote for the Target books, um, the, the Virgin books range. Bill Baggs also, however, had the opportunity uh, back in the 1990s to interview uh, quite a controversial figure in the history of Doctor Who. And that man is the man on the cover of this book, John Nathan Turner. Again, for those who perhaps don't know Doctor Who's history particularly well, John was the final producer of the classic series of Doctor Who. He was the longest serving producer of Doctor Who. He took over the reins in 1979 for the 1980 series. And he was there right till the bitter end 10 years later in 1989 when the show was unceremoniously shuffled off the screen by a disinterested BBC. John is a very conflicted and confused, confusing and fascinating character. Um, if anybody out there has read the book, uh, Totally Tasteless, The Life of John Nathan Turner, which, uh, written by Richard Marson, which came out several years ago, it's uh, a bit of an eye-opener eye um, about the man who tried to keep Doctor Who steady when all around it were trying to sink the ship. Um, and that book is an interesting counterpoint to a documentary about John which appeared on one of the Doctor Who uh, Blu-ray box sets which came out a couple of years ago. John, as I say, is a conflicted sort of character, uh, a very sort of flamboyant, show-busy producer who probably wasn't an easy fit for Doctor Who, which was this slightly wayward drama series that the BBC didn't quite know what to do with anymore. The book paints a vivid picture of him and his lifestyle. Um, he was openly gay, he lived with his partner, who was one of Doctor Who's um, assistant producers, I believe, Gary Downey, and they had an, a flamboyant lifestyle, and some of that came in for a lot of comment and criticism when the book was published, because it was the 1980s, it was a different time, um, and some of their behaviour was sort of called into question, and even the popular press picked up on it. So. John John's tenure in Doctor Who is quite controversial, not just for those salacious reasons, but also for creative reasons, because he did a lot of things in Doctor Who that um, certainly kept it from being shut down earlier than it might have done. I think a lot of fans perhaps ignore the fact that without his perseverance, his tenacity, the show would have probably died three or four years earlier than it did. And those of us of a certain age will remember the cancellation crisis, which... Uh, happened in 1985 when the series was taken off air for 18 months. And I think the BBC would have liked shot of the series then, but it was really Nathan Turner's determination that the show must go on, and, and the BBC a bit surprised by the backlash against the cancellation of the series that kept the show afloat. But the man himself is still, not exactly a mystery, but he still exerts a strange fashion, fascination over Doctor Who fans because of what he did in the show. He came along for the 1980 series, and he spruced up the show, which for three years had been looking a little bit battered. Um, 
The producer Graham Williams had been forced to introduce elements of humour into the series when the show had come under criticism in the mid-70s from Mary Whitehouse and her National Viewers and Listeners Association who, who felt the show was too violent and too graphic and too adult for what was supposed to be a tea time adventure series. So the, the horror and the fear element was replaced with a lot of comedy uh, which played up to Tom Baker's personal interests. So John came along in 1980, not only spruced up the look of the Doctor which had become a little shabby and sloppy, he changed the title sequence, he changed the title music for the first time since the early 60s when the show was created. The music had never really been, um, it had been sort of um, beefed up a little bit in the 70s but the, the basic um, version that was created by Delia Derbyshire in the 60s was very much the template for what the Doctor theme always was and to be fair always is, still is. But then in that 1980 series, which was season 18, he really changed the whole feel of the show. It became much more serious. He, he, he shook up the interior of the TARDIS, brought in new companions, got rid of old ones. And of course, he did butt heads with Tom Baker. And uh, Tom ultimately left the show because it was his seventh year. Um, he felt he'd been around for too long and he needed new challenges. And I don't think he was well to the making of the series. And I think he didn't necessarily agree with a lot of the changes that were made. And then, of course, Nathan Turner went on to cast Peter Davison, who um, carried the, the flag for the show for three years. And then the show hit Rocky Waters when uh, Colin Baker took over. And, uh, well, the rest is sort of Doctor Who's sad history as it drifted into obsolescence. The history now of this DVD, back in the 1990s, uh, and if I have a criticism of this DVD, it's the fact that there's no real context for what we're seeing, um, how it came about, when it happened... Um, it might have been nice to have some up-to-date input from Bill about how the interview took place. Um, this is a, a full-length interview, 90 minutes or so, with John Nathan Turner. Some of this has appeared on Doctor Who DVD releases over the years. Certain clips and extracts that relate to certain periods in history have been used, but this is the first time that all the footage has been used pretty much uncut because you get the cuts and the edits and so on. It's all presented pretty much as raw footage on this um, DVD. And it is fascinating watch because in many ways it does sort of mirror the the, the the rise of Nathan Turner into the you know the head of this well regarded if not necessarily flagship BBC drama and him sort of being still there as the show fell out of fortune and fell out of favour in the 1980s and that's and you can sort of watch that happening as you're listening to him being interviewed he's being interviewed in a I believe it's a cafe in Brighton so you do get all the effects of coffee machines bubbling away in the background and chatter and phones ringing and all this sort of stuff, which makes it feel very um, intimate in a way. It feels as if you're there with him and the camera's quite close up to his face. So you, you read his face and you read his expressions. What is interesting, and it's very difficult when you get behind the scenes people talking about behind the scenes, uh, sorry, behind the scenes people talking about what goes on behind the scenes because you, you never really know how much they're prepared to to tell to say um, there are always stories about what goes on behind the scenes in any TV shows particularly popular ones that have a, a big you know passionate fan following but we re very rarely find out the truth because most people are still working in the industry they don't want to you know ruin their chances of further work in the industry so their lips tend to be sealed and I think with this again because I'm not sure exactly when it was done I, I suspect mid late 90s um, although Nathan Turner was no longer with the BBC, he was still working in the entertainment industry. And there is a sensation that perhaps he doesn't want to reveal all the sort of, um, all the, 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 the nastiness, if you like, about his time with the show, because he does remain very upbeat, even when he's talking about things that weren't happy times, like he, he does recall the painful moment. It's clearly a very painful moment when the BBC told him that um, Doctor Who would be coming back, but they didn't want Colin Baker in it, and he had to sort of phone him to tell him. He'd arranged to go out for lunch with him, but before he could go out on that lunch, he was informed that the newspapers had found out and were going to print a story, so he had to tell him over the phone. And you can tell that that's something that he really regrets that, that happened. But at the beginning, it starts off with him as this bright, new, fresh-faced producer who's coming to spruce up this slightly tired show and give it a 1980 sheen. And he explains about he wanted to change the incidental music and the title music and smarten Tom Baker up and just change the format and... And, and tidy up the stories and the storytelling and that's very upbeat and you can see that he's very positive and very pleased about what he did at the time of course the thing was that he was only there for one season and he thought 
you know, it's a one season job. I get the season done, and he's quite honest about the difficulty in making a show like Doctor Who at the time, which was underfunded, under resourced, and under attack later on. Of course, then when Tom Baker left, he found himself in the position of having to cast a new Doctor, so he cast Peter Davison, and he goes through the process of how um, he cast somebody who's a complete opposite Tom Baker, this huge, larger than life extrovert, and the slightly more, I won't say timid, but softer spoken and, and less extravagant Peter Davison who at the time felt that he he didn't have the chops for the part but um, and he found himself a little bit uh, concerned that he was acting against, with some real acting heavyweights and he felt he wasn't up to the job then of course we move on to the difficult period um, of beyond the 20th anniversary in 1983 and Nathan Turner admits that that was a period at which he should have resigned and left the series because that was his high point really he'd sort of celebrated 20 years of the series by getting so many members of the cast who are still around to appear in this triumphant if slightly chaotic anniversary special and um, he sort of thinks he says quite honestly I should have left then because it was you know thinking about it downhill straight you know straight almost immediately after that quite bizarrely and it always uh, fascinates me to think that like I went to the long leap Doctor Who um, experience uh, Doctor Who celebration in 1983. This was a few months before the anniversary special was transmitted, and it was a massive turnout. The BBC was staggered by the number of people who were there. This was a hugely popular program. And then, 18 months later, the controller of BBC One wanted rid of it. He felt it was tired and overly violent, and he wanted it off the off the schedule. Just that seems quite bizarre now, in retrospect, but you know, different times and so on. But then we witness sort of. And it's strange because you see in Nathan Turner's eyes, he's trying to be upbeat. Even when things are bad, he's trying to be positive about it. But as, as the years rolled on, it became harder for him to make the series because the BBC didn't really want it. He was trying to get new people on board to revitalise it. And with retrospect, although I'm not particularly a fan of the Sylvester McCoy year, I can now see that the efforts they were making to rehabilitate the show. But he talks with fondness about Sylvester McCoy and the, the trouble he had casting Sylvester McCoy because... His heads at the um, sixth floor at the BBC at the time in Television Centre weren't convinced, so they made him bring in a casting director who agreed with his original casting. And it just seems like it was a constant struggle to get the show on the air. And of course, what's frustrating is he didn't really want to be there anymore. He wanted to go and he wanted to move on. And he was trying to create new projects. This is something which is touched on on the Totally Tasteless book. He was constantly creating new formats and new drama ideas. But as he mentions in the video, he was constantly sort of they were flattened and he was just told to go back to Doctor Who um, for the rest of his story and it is a very sad story you need to look at that documentary on the Blu-ray sets I'm sorry I can't remember which one it is off the top of my head I think it's probably season 19 the first Peter Davison series uh, could be wrong or read the totally tasteless book if you can get hold of it be beware there are some sort of um, um, slightly hair raisy anecdotes in that but I have to say, having watched this this afternoon, I can recommend this as a really interesting look, not just at the life of this uh, this man who's trying to keep this series going, but I think, it's, as I say, it's fascinating. You can see that decline in the show's popularity reflected in him as he goes through this, his era in the show and the problems he had in keeping it going and the problems that he had in getting this thing made on a tiny budget. Um, as I said, the only criticisms is I could have done with a bit of context, a little bit more background about how this interview came about, how it happened, where it, you know, exactly where it happened, where, trying to place, place it in the chronology, because clearly it's well before the new series, because he often mentions certain things about, um, in the first uh, Peter Davison series, Pete, the Doctor had three companions, he saw three companions are too many, one is what, the ideal thing, and of course we're now in a position where the Doctor has been travelling with three companions, and I think it's that, if nothing else, has proved that particular point that was correct. So I, I can recommend this pretty much undeservedly. As I said, it would be nice to know a little bit more. Uh, perhaps a short interview with Bill Barry's just contextualising it a bit more. But beyond that, it's completely raw and unedited. It's the footage as, as it was. Uh, and it's worth it's worth a look if you're a Doctor Who hardcore fan and you're interested in that particular period of Doctor Who. And that, it does fascinate me, the period of Doctor Who's the dying on screen it's it often seemed um so i can recommend this um for doctor who fans and people who are interested in the making of television in the 80s and how hard it was to get things done especially on a show like this where 
your paymasters really didn't want the show on the, on the network in, in any event. It's available from bbvproductions.co.uk. I'll provide a little link for that um, down below so you can rush and collect a copy. Um, very much recommend it. Um, I, I dare say that new series fans won't find much interest in it unless they've started watching the old stuff. But it's just interesting to hear from the man himself, as of course he's no longer with us, had he passed away several years ago. Um, but here he sort of, you know, he's fairly fresh from the Doctor experience, and although some of his memories are a bit vague, I was quite impressed by his line of thought in respect to certain things about the making of the show and the, the context of the, and the characters and the makeup and, the, and the, how the show should present itself. And I was very impressed by the very thoughtful way he, he discussed these things. So that's um, available now, as I said, from BBV Productions. I enjoyed it very, very much, and I'm going to give it a big fat 9 out of 10. It only loses a point because I, I would have liked just something to... I'd say it again, to contextualise it. But it's a very interesting slice of Doctor Who history um, from the mouth of the man who made it happen. Whether you like his stuff or not, it's interesting to hear his story. And, and, and some of it is... You can sense his frustration and his disappointment. And he's quite honest about the things that didn't work and the things he'd like to have done. Um, and you get the impression that although he's not happy with the fact that he was regarded at the time as the man who killed Doctor Who, um, he feels, you can sense the bitterness, but he's just trying not to express it too strongly. You feel that um, there's a little bit more he could possibly say, but he's holding himself back a little bit. But Notwithstanding that, it's an excellent watch and I entirely recommend it. Right, that's me done. Um, until we meet again, keep checking the stuff.